And so now can we talk about you on the B2? Yes? Yes. Okay. Now, we have never really talked very much about SN1, but if you guys feel comfortable with that, uh, we can go on to E1 and E2. Well, is it, don't we pretty much just use SN1, like, don't we just use the chart to find out if it's SN1? And if it is, then you just do it by, the leaving group comes off first, and right. then the nuclear file attacks. And what happens to the stereochemistry? It is reversed. SN1 stereochemistry. Oh, it's retained. Mm -hmm. yeah, Looks like we better go over that. Okay. <laughs> So let me. I will go over one or two examples of that at least. Yeah, so. we want to kind of make sure that we go over you and you two today. Okay. So Instead of SN one, I, I think we should at least do one or two examples of okay. SN one. Let's do it. Okay. All right. So uh, we'll, we'll try to keep it just to one or two examples. All right. So um, let's see here. So let's try to uh, write the mechanism for this reaction. Let's see if we can write the mechanism here. Okay. I'd recommend that all of you guys should uh, use pencil since uh, there's definitely a chance we might make some mistakes. No. We're pros. Yeah. Have a shh. Um, yeah. No. <laughs> Remember, let's draw not just the product, but also the mechanism. Okay, so let's talk this through so far. So what type of mechanism are we going to have here? As in one. Yeah, how do you know? Because it's a neutral oxygen, and it's a secondary. Yeah, we have a neutral oxygen. Um, so that helps us define what column we're in. Mm -hmm. um, and we have a secondary, so if you use the table on page 3, um, that gives you an SN1. So let's see, I think one of you had a negative charge on the oxygen. Um, that was me. Though. Yeah, all right. I just meant the negative charge to be the electrons that I need. Okay, the TAs are pretty picky about that. So what you want to do is, since this is neutral, you have to draw in the lone pair and put that at the tail. Oops, but I screwed that up. I changed it and did that too. Okay. This doesn't actually have a negative charge because it doesn't have an ionic bond to the hydrogen. It has a covalent bond. So what's going to happen first is the iodide is going to leave. Mm -hmm. Oh, so you draw it on, you put the head on the eye. Yeah, that's important. We should not draw the arrow like this. Because remember, the arrow does not show you where the atom is going. It shows where the electrons are going. While the electrons are not going off into the ether, they're going into a pair on the iodide. Uh, in fact, let me actually draw what we got here then. I'm actually going to draw, here's that pair. So maybe I'll even put them in the bond here. So we took the bond that used to be, we took the uh, pair of electrons that used to be in this bond and we made them into a pair on the iodide. So uh, actually a lot of the time instructors get lazy and they write their arrows like this, but this yeah. is not a good way for a beginning student to write it. The beginning student should put the head on the, on the atom so we know what's actually happening is the pair of electrons is going from the bond to the atom. All right, so that gives us these two products over here. And now we can decide what's going to happen next. Good. Okay, so now someone has to attack this positive charge. That's going to be our nucleophile. I have to draw in this lone pair. And that comes in like this. So now I'm going to draw the new, next new product. One thing we emphasized last time is that the most important part of your picture is the charges. If we don't get the charges right, uh, we might as well not try at all. Oh, right. Remember, you're always going to change two charges. You always change the charge at the initial tail and the final head. But 
oxygen um, becomes positive. Yeah, this oxygen started neutral, and it's at the initial tail, so it becomes positive. And then um, after the negative iodide. Now, notice that the iodide didn't participate in this step. Right. It was in the first step. Yeah, but isn't it still is a product in the end? Oh, it's yeah, so you, you could say that the iodide is still long. Yeah, you could say that. The important thing is to notice that this carbon started positive and now it's neutral. Okay, so now these are the two substances uh, that we have. So it's crucial to put this positive charge in over here. Are we done or is there another step? Yeah, now actually, we should actually stop right here before we do anything more. Um, is this a stereo center? Um, yeah. Yes. So, yeah, it is a stereo center. So, we have to think about the geometry here. Since this is a stereo center, we have to think about the geometry here. So, should we use a wedge or a dash here? Dash. Let's talk about that a little more. I think we talked about this uh, a couple sessions ago. Remember that if you attack something tetrahedral, you get a maximum of one product. But if you attack something trigonal planar, you get a maximum of two products. Uh, some of you might not have been here when we talked about that. But if you attack someone tetrahedral, you get a maximum of one stereo product. But if you attack someone um, trigonal planar, uh, you get uh, a maximum of two products. If you attack someone tetrahedral, you get a maximum of one product, but if you attack something trigonal planar, you get a maximum of two products. I mean two products that are stereoisomers of each other. Here you can get two stereoisomers, here you only get one um, of those possible stereoisomers. So what are we attacking here, someone trigonal planar or tetrahedral? Trigonal planar. Yeah, carbocations are trigonal planar. Oh. Carbocations are trigonal planar. We're not attacking this. Right? Yeah. This carbon, let's keep labeling the alpha carbon. The alpha carbon started tetrahedral, but by the time the nucleophile attacks it, it's trigonal planar. By the time the nucleophile attacks the alpha carbon, it's become trigonal planar. That's why it's so important to know the mechanism. If you didn't know the mechanism, you would think that the nucleophile was attacking someone tetrahedral. But the nucleophile waits and attacks someone trigonal planar. How many products does that give us? A maximum of two. That means that the nucleophile could attack from either in front of the blackboard or behind the blackboard. That means that the nucleophile could either end up, could end up either on a wedge or on a dash. So we have to draw it both ways. We can draw it once on the wedge. And once on a dash. When, as soon as we know we're attacking someone who is trigonal planar, we know we're going to get this maximum of two products. Is that always for SN1? So SN1, you're always attacking someone trigonal planar. That's right. Of course, if this was not a stereo center, it would still only be one product. That's why I said a maximum of two products. Maximum of two products. But if the if it's a stereo center. Yeah, it has to be a stereo center. Otherwise, there's only one possible stereoisomer in the first place. So that's why we need this word maximum here. Uh, but if we are attacking a stereocenter, we'll get two different stereoisomeric products. One with the um, one when it attacks from one direction and one where it attacks. So basically, here we got the product that retained the original configuration, and here we have the product that has inverted the original configuration. We're going to get both of those. That should be kind of common sense. This is flat, right? Because this is flat, the nucleophile can attack from either direction. So if it's flat like my hand, it can attack from behind the hand or in front of the hand. That doesn't happen for SN2 because in SN2, the leaving group blocks one of the directions. But here, the leaving group's already gone, so it doesn't block either direction. Okay. Um, so that's a very important idea so to watch. So in SN2, for. you can only get one product. Right, because you're attacking someone tetrahedral. And not only do you get one product, do you get a product that retains configuration or one that inverts it? Because the leaving group is blocking the original side, so the nucleophile has to come in opposite to the leaving group. Unless you do it twice, and then you get the... 
That's right. Since a single SN2 inverts the original configuration, if you do two SN2s in a row, two negatives kind of make a positive and you get back to what you started with. So remember, notice it's not enough to know what the patterns are for SN1 and SN2. You really have to know the reasons, both because it makes it easier to remember and because it makes it easier to adapt to new situations and because you might just be asked to explain what the reasons are on um, the test. For Wait, how did you say that you know it's trigonal planar and not tetrahedral? Well, we know this is tetrahedral, right? How? Uh, because it's attached to four things, so it's sp3 hybridized. Okay. If you go back to how we learned about geometry earlier, um, when the atom is attached to three, th uh, it's attached to four things, right, including the hidden hydrogen. So it's sp3. That would make it tetrahedral. But now this is only attached to three things: two carbons and a hidden hydrogen. Two carbons and a hidden hydrogen. So this is sp2 hybridized. Well, sp2 hybridization gives us a trigonal planar geometry. 